Hello, this is Impact, bringing you all the day's top stories and later in the program, more news in depth. I'm Philippa Thomas. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince warns oil prices could rise steeply if the world doesn't act against Iran. If the world does not take a strong and firm action to deter Iran, we will see further escalations that will threaten world interests. We talked to a friend of the murdered journalist Jamal Khashoggi about how much responsibility the Crown Prince is accepting for that crime. Also here on Impact, a deadly fire triggers riots at an overcrowded refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. And France says farewell to one of its favourite sons, the late former president Jacques Chirac. That's all coming up on Impact. Welcome to the programme. We're live for the next 30 minutes and you can always give me your views at Philippa BBC. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince is warning that oil prices could rise steeply if the world doesn't act to deter Iran, which he blames for the recent attack on Saudi oil facilities. Mohammed bin Salman has also said he takes full responsibility for the murder of journalist and critic Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed in the Saudi consulate in Turkey a year ago. The Crown Prince says Mr Khashoggi's killing was a heinous crime and a mistake by agents of the Saudi government but he denies allegations that he ordered it. Our security correspondent Frank Gardner travelled to Riyadh last week and has this report. The pre-dawn missile attack on Saudi Arabia's critical oil infrastructure that rocked the global oil market. The Saudis and the US blame Iran, which denies it. Now the Saudi Crown Prince is warning of a catastrophic rise in oil prices if it happens again. If the world does not take a strong and firm action to deter Iran, we will see further escalations that will threaten world interests. Oil supplies will be disrupted and oil prices will jump to unimaginably high numbers that we haven't seen in our lifetimes. The ongoing war in Yemen has already embroiled rivals Saudi Arabia and Iran, which backs the Houthi rebels. They've just released these pictures following a major attack on the border they say has resulted in thousands of troops captured, including Saudi officers. The Saudi Crown Prince committed his forces to this war over four years ago, but they have failed to defeat the Houthis. Yet it was the murder one year ago this week of this man, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, that's cast the biggest shadow over his rule. The Crown Prince was asked if, as many suspect, he ordered it. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. This was a heinous crime. But I take full responsibility as a leader in Saudi Arabia, especially since it was committed by individuals working for the Saudi government. Saudi Arabia has become a more relaxed, less austere place under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. There's public entertainment and women can drive. But critics say there is a darker dictatorial side to his rule. And the stain of the Khashoggi murder will not be easily erased. The image of Saudi Arabia around the world took a massive hit from the Khashoggi murder. Much of the leadership here was a bit slow to realize the extent. An impeachment investigation led by Democrats in Congress, stemming from allegations that he tried to convince the president of Ukraine to dig up dirt on his most likely opponent in next year's presidential election. In the last hour, Donald Trump first tweeted that the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, a Democrat, should be arrested for treason. This is what he wrote. Uh, Representative Adam Schiff illegally made up a fake and terrible statement, pretended it was mine as the most important part of my call to the Ukrainian president and read it aloud to Congress and the American people. It bore no relationship to what I said on the call. Arrest for treason? Question mark. He's tweeted again, saying again, the president of the Ukraine said there was no pressure put on him by me. End of case. Uh, tweeting again, saying who changed the long-standing whistleblower rules just before submittal of the fake whistleblower report drained the swamp, a favorite Donald Trump 
phrase and he's also tweeted again with the hashtag fake whistleblower you can tell how angry he is it is worth pointing this out to you on the accusation that congressman adam schiff is making up remarks uh, the congressman introduced his comments at thursday's impeachment committee hearing by saying he was going to outline the essence of what the president communicates not provide the exact transcribed ver version of the call so i suppose uh, we will be talking about uh, whether what was said in congress bore a significant relation to what was in the transcription. Uh, this matters, of course, if you're talking about impeachment investigations. We'll be going to our correspondents in Washington within the next hour. This weekend has seen some of the worst violence in Hong Kong in more than three months of anti-government unrest. There were running battles as protesters threw Molotov cocktails and the police fired round after round of tear gas and rubber bullets. This comes ahead of major celebrations planned in China to mark 70 years of communist rule. John Sudworth reports. They're determined to spoil the party. While in Beijing, rehearsals are in full swing for a celebration of 70 years of communist rule and a message of unity and strength. In Hong Kong, there's division uncertainty and fear. It's a fault line that cuts across class and generation. 73-year-old Chen Gei Kao is showing me the protective gear he wears when supporting the protesters. For 70 years, the ruling party has subdued its people. Do you think we are in the mood to celebrate? Huang Shui Oi is in favor of Chinese rule and says the protests are scaring off mainland Chinese tourists. I still have business, but not as much as before. I've lost at least half of my revenue. With more protests planned on Tuesday, the authorities are not taking chances. You can still taste the tear gas in the air. Hong Kong finds itself at the center of a global clash of values, authoritarianism against freedom. On the streets of this city, China's vision of its future has run into a crisis of legitimacy. The chaos continued into the night. For some, it's a principled fight. For others, a doomed strategy that risks provoking an ever more powerful China to sweep this city's freedoms away for good. John Sudworth, BBC News, Hong Kong. Greece says it will continue to move asylum seekers from its largest refugee camp on the island of Lesbos to the mainland following a deadly fire that killed at least two people on Sunday. Violent clashes broke out at the overcrowded Maria camp as an angry crowd complained that firefighters had taken too long to tackle the blaze. Nicolas Panayotopoulos, who speaks for the International Rescue Committee in Lesbos, says the government has so far done a very limited amount to move people off the island. We have seen uh, some minor movements on behalf of the government for people to be moved to the mainland. Um, there have been some announcements uh, of over 10,000 people being transferred to the mainland, but as to now, uh, we don't know of the plan or when uh, this uh, movement is going to be facilitated. I understand that there are, what, about four times as many people uh, there, refugees, as were intended uh, to be given shelter yes. there, and there have been yes. repeated warnings. Yes, uh, indeed, currently the Moria Reception Centre in Lesbos uh, hosts uh, 13,000 people with an actual capacity of 3,000 people. Um, this, as you can imagine, creates... It's a very difficult uh, living conditions uh, that exposes uh, asylum applicants to all sorts of violence, including sexual violence. Um, and there is no, we cannot even imagine what the conditions are in terms of sanitation, uh, provision of food, etc. But when the International Rescue Committee says, as it has today, these deaths can't be called accidents anymore, what do you mean? Uh, when you have uh, so many people uh, concentrated uh, in a space that is not supposed to be hosting that many people, and when you count on top of that, uh, that the majority of these people are vulnerable, uh, and they were persecuted in their country of origin, and they are 
uh, seeking safety in Europe, uh, we can imagine that um, these deaths are a direct uh, outcome of the living conditions. Should the living conditions uh, were, uh, were, you know, uh, regarding uh, relevant to the actual capacity uh, of the sites, I don't think we would be talking about this strategy right now. I mean, you are not the only uh, group to call for the immediate evacuation of refugees. So what kind of discussions mm -hmm. do you think are going on with, with the Greek government, uh, with the EU, to try to help the situation in Lesbos? Uh, I think this is a two-faceted uh, issue. One issue has to do with uh, the need for immediate uh, decongestion of all the islands uh, in the Aegean Sea, uh, where all reception centres are currently maxed out. Um, as we mentioned before, in Lesbos there are three times the capacity, in Samos it's like five times the capacity. Um, so there needs to be a plan by the Greek government uh, in coordination with uh, the NGOs that are willing to support it. Uh, to transfer these people uh, in, in dignified accommodation with access to services in the mainland. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that um, this responsibility is a responsibility that needs to be shared uh, fairly and equally uh, amongst all EU member states. Uh, Greece, as an entry point, cannot handle this responsibility on its own. And we have much more on the continuing refugee crisis online. Uh, another story that's come into us in the last few hours. Jihadists have attacked a U.S. military base in Somalia. There are reports of casualties. Local residents say they heard heavy blasts and gunfire in the southern Lower Shabelle region. The Al-Shabaab militant group said it carried out the attack. It used a car bomb to blast through the, the gates of the military base before sending fighters inside. So on BBC World News, it's talking business with Ben Bland. Uh, ben, things not looking too good for US retail. No, we're focusing our top stories uh, about Forever 21. It's the fast fashion chain set up by two South Korean immigrants about three decades ago, made its name selling affordable fashion in suburban shopping malls. It's now going to pull out of Asia and Europe completely. It's closing 350 stores around the world, including more than 170 in the US. Now, this is a symptom really of our changing shopping habits and mm. the competition that retailers are finding that comes from online. So um, you also put that in the context of more than 8,000 US stores, high street stores have closed this year. Some estimates think 12,000 could close by the end of 2019. So symptomatic of wider changes in the industry, the challenges. And, you know, if retailers don't meet those challenges, more could go the same way. So we'll be looking at what it means for the wider sector. We're also looking at the big Volkswagen case. Oh, now, yeah. This is huge. On its home turf in Germany, a class action, the first of its kind, the law in Germany was changed to allow this class action to happen. Almost half a million car owners suing Volkswagen. Uh, and so the case begins. It could be quite drawn out. It could take many months before they get a conclusion. But it's already paid out $30 billion in fines. This is over the diesel gate uh, emissions scandal. And we're also going to look at biometric payments and paying for things in shops just using your smile or your fingerprint or your retina. So we'll find out about that technology All as well. All right. Thank you very much. See you later. See you later. Ben. And still to come here on Impact, we'll bring you a special report from Vietnam where climate change is having a huge impact on lives in the Mekong Delta. In all Russia's turmoil, it has never quite come to this. President Yeltsin said the day would decide the nation's destiny. The nightmare that so many people have feared for so long is playing out its final act here. Russians are killing Russians in front of a grandstand audience. It was his humility which produced affection from Catholics throughout the world. But his departure is a tragedy for the Catholic Church. This man, Israel's right-winger Ariel Sharon, visited the religious compound and that started the trouble. He wants Israel alone to have sovereignty over the holy sites, an idea that's unthinkable to Palestinians. After 45 years of division, Germany is one. In Berlin, a million Germans celebrate the rebirth of Europe's biggest and richest nation.
Welcome back to Impact on BBC World News. A reminder of our top story this hour. Saudi Arabia's crown prince is warning that oil prices could rise steeply if the world doesn't act to deter Iran. Mohammed bin Salman has also said he takes full responsibility for the murder of Saudi journalist and critic Jamal Khashoggi, but he denies allegations that he ordered the killing. Well, do the Crown Prince's comments represent a significant shift? Here's Rami Khoury, Professor for Journalism at the American University of Beirut, also a friend of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, no, it only represents a continuing uh, kind of cover-up or not taking actual responsibility. I mean, political leaders tend to say something and it usually the truth is usually the opposite. So if he does actually take responsibility, then what does that mean? A crime was committed, a massive cover-up was done, a brutal crime, a grotesque crime, a uh, very inhuman uh, uh, crime. And so what does it mean to take responsibility? You just say, oh, well, it happened and we'll try not to make it happen again. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's just a whole range of other things that he's accused of and his leadership uh, in terms of human rights activists being put in jail and um, the block blockade on Qatar and the war in Yemen. And there's just such a variety of things that people are criticizing the Saudi leadership for, that it has to be seen beyond the Khashoggi killing. But the Khashoggi killing is the most uh, gruesome, the most dramatic. Um, and, and, it, and it represents the greatest continuous lie by the Saudi government uh, in the past year. The Crown Prince, of course, says he can't be responsible for all the thousands of civil servants and government officials who work under him. Well, that's what most political leaders will say, especially ones who are not elected and are held accountable in any way. Um, but the whole the whole point of leadership is responsibility uh, and accountability. <clears throat> and of course, he doesn't know what every single person is doing who works for the Saudi government. But these people were close to him. They, some of them were, were in his office. There was communications between people in his office and the people in Istanbul. So the linkages to his office and to senior people in his office, security people, are very clear. Uh, and that's why the CIA, for instance, which tends to be pretty careful about these things, uh, said that it had, you know, high... Uh, uh, with high probability that they thought that um, Mohammed bin Salman uh, <clears throat> either knew about this or actually even ordered it possibly, but there was a link uh, to him. So I think the uh, the link to the Crown Prince's office is pretty well established uh, by now. Uh, Rami Khoury, can is, I just ask you, do you think that this case has changed the way Saudi is treated by its Western allies? Oh, absolutely. The Saudis are in a very difficult position now because the you have some people like Trump and others who continue to support them and, and deal with them as they do with other autocrats like Sisi in Egypt and others. But you have, for instance, the Senate in the United States is literally passing legislation to stop sending arms to the Saudis to, to get out of the war in Yemen. Um, and you have private people who are canceling engagements with Saudis. So it definitely has put pressure on the uh, Saudi government's and, and relations. Yet, and I'm sorry to cut across you, it's just the time <clears throat> being short, but and yet, as Mohammed bin Salman's been saying today, uh, Saudi Arabia does in fact hold the card that they, they, much of the world's oil supply uh, can be sourced there or in the Gulf. And he's warning, you know, if, if you hit stability, if you hit international stability, the world's economy might shake. Well, that's, again, what all um, autocrats and oil-producing countries say. Saddam Hussein used to say that. and others. <clears throat> the reality is the world has seen oil production in, in Iraq, in Libya, in, in Yemen, in Syria um, be cut um, quite a bit in the last three, four years because of wars, and everything seems pretty fine with the world economy. So that's not a, a valid argument. And the, 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 the lure of money from the Saudis and other oil producers is very strong. And therefore, you get people like the British government, for instance, that continues to sell arms and, and deal with the war in Yemen and stuff like that, and others in Europe. So he, there is a moment here of uh, a turning point that it's possible that the pressure could increase on the Saudis. It's possible <clears throat> that it could dissipate and then they'll, they'll get away with it. But it's surprising to me how intense and continuous has been the public 
uh, criticism of the Saudi government because of the Khashoggi killing, but also these other elements as well. Vietnam is thought to be one of the countries most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. That's already having a huge impact on those living in the Mekong Delta, Vietnam's agricultural heartland. This report from Ashley John Baptiste. Nguyen Vinh Long lost his house because of climate change. He and other families across the Mekong Delta are facing an increasingly desperate situation. There used to be two houses where you can see this open space of water in July. They crumbled into the river due to erosion. And you can see these sandbags that have been put in place to try and protect the houses. Now further down here, the couple have created a temporary home because they are nervous that the house is going to collapse into the river. It's not just houses. Livelihoods are being lost in the delta. This is the agricultural heartland of the country, but rising sea levels, coastal erosion and salt water intrusion are making farming increasingly difficult, and so thousands are being displaced. Families who feel unable to cope with the changes leave for cities like Ho Chi Minh. Năm về trước sống thoải mái cũng bình thường vui vẻ, cũng làm ăn cũng được. Nhưng mà thời gian sau này có cái khó là dạng nước thì nó nãy có nói xâm mặn nó bị phèn, nó bị nhiễm. Thì mình ở dưới đồng bằng thì mình trồng trọt cây trái nhà nông mà giống như nông nghiệp rồi sau này nó nhiễm phèn nhiễm mặn rồi không có có, có làm ăn được, được làm ăn thua lỗ. Thật ra ở dưới thì cũng khó sống hiện đại vậy chứ sống bây giờ mới chuyển lên đây làm. The government is trying to help. They've created relocation programs for vulnerable families. They've also put dikes in place to try and help mitigate the impact of flooding. But some local scientists are concerned their impact in the Delta's ecosystem. So what's being done about it? We believe that youths are the drive, the agent for change. And it's much easier to impact on the way they think. 21-year-old Lin is running a workshop called Lens on Mekon. She's gathered students from across the country and Delta region to learn about the environment and how to film. They hope by educating themselves and learning to tell these stories more widely, people both here and internationally will take greater action to protect the region. This is such a big problem. Do you feel like you can make a difference? Yeah. Things start from small changes. But at the same time, it requires the whole ecosystem to collaborate, from the governmental sector to um, the public. What happens here in Vietnam isn't unique. The World Bank estimates that over 140 million people could be internally displaced by 2050 because of climate change. Vietnam is both a warning and an example of how the world will have to adapt and change. Ashley John Baptiste, BBC News, Vietnam. A day of mourning is taking place in France for the former president Jacques Chirac, who died last week at the age of 86. World leaders joined almost 2,000 people for a service in Paris. His coffin has been lying in state over the weekend with thousands of people queuing to file past it. Lucy Williamson reports. The body of Jacques Chirac, his coffin draped in the French flag, was carried into the courtyard at Les Invalides by eight of his former bodyguards. The military honours in front of President Emmanuel Macron, the first chapter in today's public remembrance. The coffin was then accompanied through the streets of Paris on its way to the Church of Saint-Sulpice, where dozens of leaders, both past and present, had gathered to honour him. The crowds outside the church paying their last respects to a man who, for all his perceived flaws, held a special place in the national memory of France. Inside, the coffin made its way past a sea of faces, including that of the Russian president Vladimir Putin and several former French leaders. Jacques Chirac earned the affection of many people here by his easy charm and his strong stance against the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. President Macron described him as someone who embodied a certain idea of France. Flags are flying at half-mast 
and later today, a minute's silence will be held across the country. His body has now left San Sulpice on its way to the cemetery in Montparnasse for burial. After 12 years as president and almost 20 as mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac is making his final journey through the streets of the French capital. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. And we finish this edition with a developing story. President Trump has suggested the congressman leading the impeachment inquiry against him ought to be arrested for treason. Without supplying evidence, Mr. Trump accused Adam Schiff, Democratic chair of the House Intelligence Committee, of having faked a transcript of a controversial phone call between the US and Ukrainian presidents. Here's the first in a run of tweets in the last hour or so. A representative Adam Schiff illegally made up a fake and terrible statement, pretended it was mine as the most important part of my call to the Ukrainian president, and read it aloud to Congress and the American people. It bore no relationship to what I said on the call, arrest for treason, question mark. Obviously, very serious allegation, very serious matter. All round, we'll be hoping to go live to Washington when I'm back with the next edition of Impact. That's after Ben and the business. See you then. Are you having any negative thoughts? There are many who prey on the innocent. I'm sure your kind would agree.